Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 479th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Today on our podcast, we have someone who got creative with 80 pounds of fruit. We're talking with returning guest Katie Fiore about apple abundance. Katie is an Arizona native who spent most of her life thinking she had a brown thumb. Five years ago, her first successful attempt at growing food was herbs grown in wine barrels. Since then, she has become an urban farm junkie. In 2018, she planted 15 fruit trees and bushes in her backyard and has started adding a few raised beds to her garden. Now she's up to 21 fruit trees on her property, all with sweet potatoes planted underneath them. A career change last summer has given her the time to pursue a healthier, lower-stress life with her new husband, Mark. She is currently following her dreams of blogging all about her adventures, nurturing her backyard food forest, and helping Grow PHX establish a speakers bureau in Arizona. Katie, we got to meet you in episode 452 back in February of this year. Welcome back to the show. Are you ready to rock? I am. Excellent. So, during our last interview, we talked all about sweet potatoes. How are they doing? They are doing great. I wound up with so many slips that I was able to plant probably, I would say, about four or five per tree. And like you mentioned before, I have 21 fruit trees. So I have a lot of sweet potatoes all over my entire yard. Wow. But the ones that have been thriving the most are in the sunniest locations. So I'm so excited because the ones in my front yard where I'm not able to do any shading, those trees, even midsummer right now, they are still sprouting new growth. And it is the hottest part of the summer right now. And the sweet potatoes underneath are just exploding and covering the ground for them. They are doing a great job. <laughs> Excellent. So one of the things that we do here in Phoenix is we have a fruit tree education program where we teach people how to successfully grow fruit trees. And one of the things that we highly suggest is that you plant a cover crop underneath them. And one of those cover crops is sweet potatoes. So that's what that's what you've done. And what is a sweet potato slip? The slips are the starts from the potato. So when you take the potato and put it in water, it'll start to grow the vines off the top. Oh, yes. And instead of planting the whole potato, you can take each vine, cut it from the potato, root that, and then plant those. And those grow into multiple vines. So I had seven potato production potatoes to give me all of the different vines that we've got going. Excellent. And you're going to have lots of shade around the base of your trees because it's really important to shade the ground underneath your trees. I, I discovered this a couple of years ago that in my front yard, the unshaded dirt was 160 degrees in August and the shaded, the shaded dirt or shaded areas was only 89 degrees under there. So that uh, seems to be one of the secrets of our success that you're finding, yes? Yes, absolutely. And an extra bonus is I didn't realize that they gave off flowers, but they have little flowers that look like petunias. Oh, yes, they do. <laughs> and sweet potato vines are edible. Mm -hmm. And you get to dig up some sweet potatoes at the end of the season. Yep. So they've been, they've been absolutely going gangbusters. Nice. So today we're here to talk about an amazing amount of apples that we had this year. And one of the things I noticed this year are apples, peaches, and apricot harvests were mind-blowingly big. And I have an apple, a large apple tree in the backyard here at the Urban Farm. And so I was looking for somebody to give apples to. And I pinged Katie on social media and I said, uh, you interested? And what happened? I came and I picked 77 pounds of apples off of your tree. Wow. And I only covered the lower branches. That wasn't even anything that I could, couldn't reach from a ladder. Yeah, I was going to say that was just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. And then I also got three pounds from my trees, which I had planted my two back in January of 2018. Mm -hmm. So it was their first time for giving fruit. And you had an abundance. So I just decided to start creating and see what I could do with it. <laughs> nice. So let's talk about abundance for a minute. One of the things that I've said for years is that the only place this notion of lack lives is between our ears. Because when I look at the abundance that's produced in my yard, it's mind-blowing. So let's talk about abundance for a little while. I think a lot of us are afraid of what to do with abundance. When my when I first told my husband how many trees that we wanted, his very first response was, what are you going to do with all that fruit? 
And I think we kind of pull back because we don't always know what to do with abundance. And so interestingly enough, we avoid it instead of embracing it and saying, mm-hmm. I'll figure out what to do with that. Mm-hmm. And having that abundance allows us to discover an experiment without guilt. You know, if you went out and you bought 80 pounds of apples, there is a different pressure to make something work out of all of it and have every single experiment be delicious or else you feel like you wasted your money or your time. And when you're given this gift from your backyard, there's not that pressure to have it turn out well. You can get creative and think, you know, if it's not the best dish I've ever made, it's okay. And did you have that happen this year? No, everything turned out pretty darn good. (laughs) But I think apples are such an easy thing when you're cooking. You know, it's hard to mess that up. Right. Some of the things we did, I kind of think in like long term and short term with what I'm making, especially when you have a large amount of food like that. And with apples, there's so many easy long term things. Like I used a mandolin to slice several of them and put them in a food dehydrator and got the apple chips. And with that, you can let them kind of dehydrate and get that almost like the leathery, softer apples, or you can let them go overnight. And you get those real crisp chips from it. I gave you some of the cider that I made. Yeah, hold on. Let's go. So. Let's, before we go before <laughs> we go past the apple chips, I'm actually still eating apple chips from last year because I had so many of them. So they last a long time, <laughs> right? Once you dehydrate them. Yeah, once they're dehydrated, it's awesome. And you can even use that as accents for stuff. You know, throw in some apple chips to give a little crunch to things. So I love them. You know what I did this morning? I just thought of this, not on, not thinking that you and I are going to be talking today, but I had some apple chips, actually a batch from two years ago that I was still munching on. So I, it was one of my favorite things. And I just, I always make a lot of them. So I had maybe three quarters of a cup left over and I just dumped it in my oatmeal. And I cooked, nice. it, you know, I cooked the apple chips up for, you know, maybe five minutes and threw some raisins in there and, and then put the oatmeal on top. And that was my breakfast this morning. So, And that's what I love is that you can make stuff with it and use it for the entire year or in your case, maybe two years later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but having that abundance allows you to use it year round if you preserve it correctly. And for so many of these, it's not hard to do even though it's a little intimidating to learn it at first. So t- let's talk about dehydrating since we're there at the moment. What was that, what's that process look like? You briefly touched on it, but give me a little bit more in depth. So with the apples, you could slice it with a mandolin is the easiest thing to get consistent sizes. And then you can do something to preserve the color by dipping it in like a lemon juice or something. You have the choice of sprinkling cinnamon on it or any kind of flavors and then just spreading it out in the dehydrator. And the timing, you want to get it dry enough that it's not going to start to decompose, but you could let it get crisper because I like those real crisp apple chips. Mm -hmm. I do too. What do you mean decompose? Well, if you leave too much moisture in it and it's in a sealed bag over time, oh, yes. if there's too much moisture, that could still rot. So you want to make sure that you get enough moisture out that it's at the state where it's going to preserve itself. Yeah. And I, on apple chips, I, I go all the way. Mine are, yeah. mine are chewy <laughs> and there's no moisture Crispy. left in them. Hence the reason <laughs> I can save them for two years if they last that long. Although the past couple of years we've had such an abundance. It's like, just make more apple chips, Greg. Well, I love the idea because so many times you get the oatmeal with apples or fruit already dried and in it. Mm -hmm. And this way you're controlling your own and you're controlling your sugar content too. Oh, yeah. So for people who are trying to eat super healthy and low in sugar, that's a great way to do it by creating your own. Although I did add honey to it this morning. (laughs) You know, I'm sure it was natural and it helps with allergies because it came from Arizona. There you go. The next thing was... Apple cider. Mm, Tell me about that. For the apple cider, I use an instant pot just because it makes the process a little bit faster than boiling. But I went through and cut the apples into quarters, cut the core out, um, and then put it in skin and everything and added some of the cinnamon, some of the different spices and covered them with water and then just set them for about half an hour in the instant pot. And through that process, it pulled the flavor out of the apple and into the water. And basically all you do is you drain the cider off and then you get the extra apple solids. And what I did with those, because they were so cooked through, 
that's what I used in my apple butter. So I oh. took the apple solids out of that, nice. kept the juice from the cider, and then I used an immersion blender on the solids and used that as the base for my apple butter. And then added a couple more spices to that and a little bit of the, the cider. And all of a sudden, I also got apple butter out of the same batch. <laughs> wow. So made apple cider, which you did mm-hmm. give me a jar of. Thank you very much. <laughs> And with the leftover stuff, that's that's the thing that we often forget is what do you do with the extra stuff? And in permaculture, I like to call permaculture the art and science of working with nature. We don't look as anything as waste. We look at it as how can we use it? And that was a really brilliant step to take to make the apple butter. And even the cores, that went into my compost. So every part of the apple got used either in my cooking or will be used in the garden. Nice. Here at the Urban Farm, I have an apple cider press and an apple crusher to make apple juice or apple cider for that matter. And I'm pretty sure you borrowed mine from me to process (laughs) some of these 70 pounds of apples. But what I just heard you say was that you put apple cider in a pot and cooked it. Tell Tell me, I know you use the apple press. What's the difference in, what did you do there? So with the apple press, I brought two things from you. There was a crusher. And for that, you can put the apples into it whole, core and all. And that, there's a crank and then it spits it out and it's all crushed up. And then I also borrowed the press from the Cool Tool Shed, which is basically a little wooden barrel on the outside. And then there's a crusher, like a press that goes down like a flat circle. And as it screws in, it goes down and compresses the crushed apple inside and has all of the juice flow out. So from that, I made apple juice, which if you want to get a little bit fancy, you could convert that into a hard apple cider Mm -hmm. or into like an apple wine. Mm -hmm. But the difference between that and the cider that I made in the Instant Pot is I just kept that juice fresh and I didn't add any flavoring to it. For the cider that I made in the Instant Pot, I added ground cinnamon, allspice, and just a little bit of sugar. So they are kind of a different taste Profile. to the two. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And I love the idea of having that cool tool shed, P.S., not just because I got to use it, but because anyone could do it, even people who aren't local. If you have a couple friends, I was looking at Amazon and the apple crusher was between like 99 and 317 and then there's apple presses between $60 and 425 So it depends on how much you want to spend on it. Uh-huh. But if you go in with a couple friends who have apple trees, you know, every year you guys could just rotate that around when it's apple harvest season and everyone gets some time to make their own fresh apple juice. So. Nice. I'm very thankful for the cool tool shed. Yeah, <laughs> and it's so, a great investment between it, friends. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So you've mentioned a couple of times something we're calling the cool tool shed. Tell me about that. That's part of the Growth PHX initiative. And I believe you guys have the Mesquite Mill here in Arizona. You've also got the apple crusher and the press. And it's basically where here in Arizona, we can say, hey, I'd like to borrow this, reserve it with you, check it out, you know, and then you have time to use it without having to own and store it at your house. And it's something we can rotate and just share as a community too, yeah. which I love. Yeah, that's that's been a passion project for me for a while to set up the cool tool shed for <laughs> things like dehydrators. I you know, I have a three hundred dollar dehyd- stainless steel dehydrator that's got almost two cubic feet in it, which is huge for nice. a dehydrator. Yeah. That'll also be in the tool the cool tool shed. So that's amazing. And I love that, you know, because when you, when you do stuff like that and we can just share with each other, mm-hmm. it benefits everybody. It's yeah. not like we're going to be dehydrating or pressing apples every day of our lives. Right, exactly. <laughs> so. All right, so apple sauce. You also made some Yeah, I also made the applesauce. You got a jar of that. And for the applesauce, kind of the same thing where I cut it into quarters, took the core out, and then just left the skin on. For that, I only added a cup of water when I put it into the Instant Pot. And from it cooking down, the rest of the water for the sauce was created. But I love that because you can control your sugar content. Yeah. And when you have the applesauce, like you can use that all year long in recipes. There's so many different things that you can make with the apples. And this way, when it comes time for fall, because for us in Arizona, we've got to get the fruit off the trees before July when it really gets hot and starts baking it on the trees. Mm -hmm. But we can still have that fall apple experience by preserving it through applesauce. And prior to doing this, I literally learned the week before how to can stuff. So it's not like I'm a canning expert. You can buy a set of canning set with like the pot and all the little utensils for $35 on Amazon. Yep. And 
literally, like, I learned the week before how to do canning stuff with some of the preserves. I've listened to your Pomona Pectin podcast episode and was inspired. Yep. So I learned how to do that. And then when you sent out the text, I was like, oh, I have all of those tools now. Yes, please let me learn how to make applesauce. So that was my first adventure and foray into applesauce and canning just in the time when, when I had collected all that fruit from you. Wow. But... Your house smells heavenly. (laughs) And yes, canning is that easy. You just have to follow a few easy steps. People are so Mm -hmm. afraid of it, you know? Yeah. And it's, especially for apples, because they already have enough acid that you don't have to use any of like the lemon juice or anything. Mm -hmm. They are so, so easy where you just cook it down and then the canning process is really simple. You just have to do it once or twice to feel confident that you know how to do it and that it works. Really, that's the only like thing to get over is get over yourself and just try it when it comes to canning. (laughs) Right, exactly. Well, and you know that you can use your Instapot for canning, right? No, I haven't tried that. Yeah. Yeah. For the pressure canning? I have I have an actual pressure canner from I don't know, I've had it for twenty plus years. And Kari, our friend Kari Spencer, said, Greg, I just use my Instapot for pressure canning. It's like Nice. Well, that makes perfect sense. I will have to use that for stuff in the future and yeah. explore that because I did not realize I could use that tool as well. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. So out of <laughs> eighty pounds of apples. What did the end abundance look like? I had, well, that's not even counting like the short-term things that I made out of it. Well, all right. had, tell me about those. <laughs> I had probably like eight jars of applesauce. I had a whole bunch of the apple butter that I gave away. And I had probably six jars of the, the big jars for the apple cider. Mm-hmm. But I also made an apple bread. And that's super easy. It's kind of the same concept as banana bread, Mm -hmm. but instead you chop up the apples and add it to it. Or if you don't want to do the full bread making, you could just get like a basic muffin mix. And instead of having blueberries in it, just chop up apples and put those in instead and make an apple muffin. I also did apple slices with brie and crackers one night when I had a girl's night. Mm -hmm. And I made an awesome apple coleslaw. So with that, you have your basic coleslaw ingredients, but then you julienne a bunch of the apples and mix it in and add some like cherries and blueberries. And it's almost like makes it like a summer coleslaw because you've got all that fruit added into it. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, I'm sitting over here with my jaw on the floor. It's like, what? You made yeah, it coleslaw totally out together. of apples. I still had some of the regular coleslaw material um, as far as like the cabbage or you yeah. can use Brussels sprouts. It's really good when you do Brussels sprouts. But yeah, dice them up, julienne them and add them into your coleslaw and add some like dried fruit. And it's really good. Wow. That's incredible. And then? And then we also cooked it and with a little bit of cinnamon and used it with pancakes and waffles. I cut it up and cooked it with onions one night and used that over a pork loin. Because apples and pork are really great together. Uh-huh. I tried an apple cheddar sandwich, which was fun. I did another night where we cooked it over pork chops. And then also after we did the mesquite milling, I used some mesquite flour with the apple and made a little crumble. Wow. It definitely got used. <laughs> you have just got totally creative. When you think about it, especially when you have an abundance like that, the things you can mix apples with would be like cinnamon, sugar, pork, bacon, sausage, like brie, cheddar, the gruyere, oats, caramel, onions, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, like any of the dried fruits, Mm -hmm. all of the desserts you could make into some kind of apple dessert. All the breakfast things could be made into an apple breakfast. They also go great with balsamic, with greens, like putting them in a salad, or you could pair it with chicken and sage. And it's really good or like apples with any kind of cream cheese. So even just knowing those ingredients, like flavor profiles pair well, you can get really creative and just start making your own stuff, knowing that those things are ones that that work with it naturally. Wow. I I had no idea. In the past, (laughs) I've made dried apples, apple cider, and applesauce. No, like take them with a, take an acorn squash and cut it in half and then chop up your apples, put some sausage in there, 
you know, like make a, a little stuffing for an acorn squash and it's a great fall dish. You could add apples to turkey dressing, you know, for like Thanksgiving uh-huh. when you have the, the stuffing for it. So there's just so many ways to make different savory dinners and sides, even like apples and the broccoli. If you do that in kind of like a summery salad, kind of like the coleslaw, uh-huh. that's another one that works really fun together. How did your brain figure all this out? Some of it was because I had the abundance and it's like, okay, well, what do I do with it now? How can I, how can I make it into breakfast, lunch, and dinner and use all of this? But it's also once you start to learn this is the flavor I like with it, it triggers other things. You know, once you start to think of apples in a savory way and pairing them with the cheeses, pairing it with the sausages and the meats, it'll start to trip those other things of like, oh, yeah, I could use it with this recipe and just tweak it this way. So you get creative when you have the opportunity. You just have to give yourself the opportunity. You know, Kari, uh, Kari Spencer, our friend, awesome author and teacher, one of the classes that we teach in Growing Food, the Basics, is on yard sustainability or food sustainability, looking at making sure that you plan ahead and have the tools in place so that you can handle what abundance is coming at you. Mm -hmm. And that's really important because all of a sudden, if you have 80 pounds of apples sitting on your table, it's like, what do I do with all of these? And it sounds like you've done some pretty nice planning on that. It was part of my my process of justifying to my husband of how we could use 21 fruit trees on our property. Oh, nice. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I had to justify how I was going to use all of this stuff. But at the same time, it was part of the excitement of just having it and what can you do and get creative. I love to play with food and I love to experiment and come up with new things and it it allows me to do that and I was very lucky that you had some extra and that's one of the things when you've got extra fruit and you have that abundance even if you didn't plan for it partner with a friend maybe they want to get creative with you or they want to take stuff and you know help you out like I did with your crop Mm -hmm. but you don't have to be afraid of having the abundance and you can do the same thing with peaches apricots citrus, any of that stuff, like you can make so many things if you just think a little bit outside of the box instead of just straight eating the fruit or just dehydrating it or just mashing it. There's Mm -hmm. so many great ways to use it. Nice. Every fall, the Great American Seed Up happens here in Phoenix, Arizona. This is kind of a sidestep from the apple conversation, but it it addresses the abundance piece because what we do at the Great American Seed Up, you can find out about it at greatamericanseedup.com. What we do is we bring in over a ton, it's over 2,000 pounds of different varieties of seeds that people can then come in the room. First of all, they can take classes on what to do with them, how to plant them, how to start them, how to save seeds, and then they can purchase at bargain prices seeds. And you came last year. What did you think of that event? It was awesome. Like just the energy and seeing so many people excited and talking about what is in their yard, sharing tips and the conversations between total strangers was amazing. And I loved the talks and having that knowledge available because you really can like go shop your seeds, go sit down, take a bunch of notes, listening to a talk, go back, find more stuff. And the price compared to what I would have paid in other stores because you're doing the bulk and you're choosing how much, how many tablespoons you want of something, Uh it really is a great opportunity to not only learn and get confident in what you're doing with seeds and how to save them for the future, but also they get a great price on it, especially with all the education. Yeah. So, Uh, and, And really the big key is to get you saving your own seeds in the future. Yep. And I have been doing that. It's super easy with peppers. That was like the first thing that I (laughs) did. (laughs) But peppers, squash. I have a Hubbard squash growing in my yard right now. Oh, nice. um, That is from seeds that I saved. I got the squash at a farmer's market locally and then saved the seeds and used it. So it's it's good. I've got a watermelon right now that's going gangbusters in the backyard from seed up seeds. But again, it's that abundance and what do you do with it? And it's easy once you start to think out of the box. Like the watermelon, you can do an awesome little salad and put watermelon, fresh mint, feta cheese, and balsamic vinegar. And like that alone is an awesome little summer salad. Yeah. You are so creative when it comes to making up (laughs) stuff out of your yard. That is so cool. It's awesome to use it. That's one of my favorite things is being able to walk in the backyard and pick something off of a tree and then like 
do not even farm to table, but just like yard to table. Yeah. Well, and there's so much that, you know, there's, again, it's the abundance thing. And there's always something to eat in the yard here at the urban farm. I've designed it and, and planted it that way. And that's the great thing is if you can think seasonally, you know, what is your yard producing that seasonal yep. season and eat to match it? Like you're not only looking forward to fall because that's the time when you harvest your sweet potatoes or whatever it is that you're bringing from your yard at that point mm-hmm. or summer is peach season. So it gets you excited about what's coming up, but also you can be very strategic and make sure you have that abundance at all times of year available. Yay. Successive planting. Yes. And then you know it's fresh. Yep, exactly. Planting your garden so that you always have something to eat. Mm-hmm. And you can get that even in the summer in Arizona. Yeah. You can still get that. So I'm going to shift on you. And as a returning guest, I'd like to have you share about a vivid childhood memory associated with food (laughs) so this might explain a lot or it might make people think you have no taste buds but one of my first childhood memories when it comes to food was that I my mom would do a lot of like frozen foods that she'd warm up in the microwave Uh and I think like you know my grandparents generation it was a lot of the canned vegetables for my childhood it turned more into like frozen veggies and bags that you would reheat. And now it's shifted much more to like that fresh emphasis. But as a kid, it was a lot of like frozen peas and broccoli. Mm, And for the peas, I actually didn't like them cooked. I preferred them frozen on my plate. So she would literally just take the peas out of the freezer, (laughs) pour them on my plate. (laughs) And that's how I liked it. Wow. Because I didn't... (laughs) I didn't like them cooked, but the funny thing is, I think because I grew up eating that way and so much was frozen or like cooked and prepared, like the novelty of the freshness and knowing how fresh it is, is really one of the things that I enjoy having the food available and being able to bring it in, knowing it's fresh and the taste is, is better too. So yeah, frozen peas was my jam when I was little. (laughs) Well, and it make, honestly, it makes perfect (laughs) sense. They're sweet. They're small, and Mm -hmm. I'm an ice chewer, so... They have a fun crunch. (laughs) Exactly. They have a fun crunch to them, so it it actually makes perfect sense. Yes, and I do still like frozen fruit as a way to cool down my wine. I Mm. will say that. (laughs) Yes, of course. (laughs) Freeze some grapes or cherries and then put it in there. If you need to cool something down quick, it is perfect. (laughs) Nice. And do you have a new piece of advice for our listeners? You know, I think it goes along the same lines, just with the different twists of abundance is don't wait, you know, don't wait to start doing it. And there's so many people who say, I'll wait to do this when, but what you're really doing is you're cutting down the amount of time to enjoy that thing throughout your life. So whether it's travel, life experiences, planting something in the garden, anything that you've dreamed of doing, Stop putting it off because that gives you, if you just start doing it now, there will never be a perfect time for most things. So if you just start doing it, it's going to give you longer to enjoy it. So be strategic, be smart. Don't start planting things that aren't going to be smart to plant right now, but look at your next year, plan it out, see when you should be putting everything in the ground, get everything ready, get your soil right, and then just start doing it and don't wait. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Katie. Thanks for having me back to chat about apples. Yeah, you bet. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? Um, I have my website, which is adventuristaaz.com, A-D-V-E-N-T-U-R-I-S-T-A-A-Z.com. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or Pinterest under Adventurista AZ, or shoot me an uh, email at katie at adventuristaaz.com. Awesome. And you can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash 80 pounds. We are your <laughs> urban farm. I know, pretty good, right? <laughs> yeah. We are your urban farming resource. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and everywhere podcasts are found. Also visit urbanfarm.org to find articles, webinars, courses, and more. And if you'd like to hear more from Katie, you can find her on our 452nd podcast episode at urbanfarm.org forward slash sweet potatoes. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. 
Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.